and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again! And I don't think there's a single more worthless book from the New 52 than Batman the Dark Knight. This is the third time patrons have wanted me to cover something from this series. Oh sure, there are individually some good issues here and there. Gail Simone did a Villain Month issue that focused on the New 52 ventriloquist that I liked, and Moarte spotlighted. But that really was something that should have been a Batgirl tie-in, since the character was from there, not Batman the Dark Knight. What, no Villain Month appearance for the White Rabbit? Or for Batman's deadliest opponent that kickstarted the book? One Face? As I said in that initial review that featured those two characters, this is a book that has the least reason to exist in a sea of Batman books released for the New 52, either books starring him or featuring adjacent characters, there is no guiding principle here. The closest you could maybe say was that the book seemed to exist to talk about the revised origins of Batman villains, but that raises the question of why they needed to revise the origins at all. Then again, that just reminds us that there was no reason to do the New 52 at all either, so there you go. Villains Month was another thing we talked about before in a Patreon-sponsored review, where we looked at the terribly told and not very interesting origins of the Green Lantern villain Relic. And yeah, based on the other Villains Month stuff I've read, it really does just seem to be an excuse to do one-offs talking about the origins of some characters with mixed results. And then we have Dwella Dent, aka Harlequin, aka Joker's daughter. I've talked a little about her before, particularly over a decade ago when her death was the inciting incident of frickin' Countdown! But as a reminder, she was a character who was originally supposed to be Two-Face's daughter, but through various continuity reshufflings, they decided to make her claiming to be the daughter of various villains her thing. Further, as basically a not-as-murderous-but-still-kind-of-villainous version of the Joker. Occasionally an anti-hero, etc. Until Countdown, where it turned out she was actually the daughter of the Jokester, the hero version of the Joker from the Mirror Universe version of the DCU, aka Earth-3. Gotta love a character whose origins rival Donna Troy for overcomplication and retcons. I never really thought of the character as anyone that popular enough to keep popping up and being revised, but she must have been, and they decided to dust her off for the new 52. Badly. Oh god, so badly. Yes, this issue of Batman the Dark Knight does not actually feature Batman, because now it's time for her Villain Month origin. How to describe this book? Well, according to my script here, I- Ow! The Edge. Let's dig into Batman The Dark Knight number 23.4 and we'll explain it. The cover is fine, not fond of the quasi-graffiti style for the Joker's Daughter Number 1 used to cover up the regular logo that we saw variations of on other Villain Month covers, but it kinda works for her. Also, hi Batman! The cover explains why you're not in this book, and I kinda dig that! Although amusingly, that might just be reused artwork, since I saw the same Batman pose, just with vines instead of chains, on Detective Comics Number 23.1. But you may be noticing that she's sporting, like, some wrinkly Joker mask. Yeah, and the edginess of this book starts out with a minor detail I need to explain. That mask? It's literally the Joker's face. 
which he had another villain cut off of him in the first issue of the New 52 Detective Comics. You may begin making face-off jokes at your leisure. It was supposed to be, like, a sign of rebirth or something, but then he stapled it back on? I don't know, it was dumb. The storyline that it was leading into, Death of the Family, was not as dumb, but it was this continuation of the last few years that the Joker is, like, the super smartest, bestest villain ever, and always ten steps ahead of everybody, and just blah. And yeah, the thing that the title was referring to was more temporary separation of the family due to traumatic events. But yeah, Joker's daughter apparently got a hold of the face and uses it as her mask. Point is, the New 52 loved its ridiculously edgy, over-the-top violence, so let's get that train a-rollin' in this book! We open in some kind of cave that has lights in it thanks to luminous vines that Poison Ivy apparently set up at some point, according to later exposition, where a woman in a hooded cape narrates, Gotham City isn't the kind of town a girl from suburbia usually ventures to, let alone ventures under. But this is where that guy from Craigslist said he was selling the TV, so here I am. Too dark. Too scary. A mugger's paradise. And yet property taxes are still way too expensive down here. Even Gotham's so-called protector Batman is terrifying. Alfred! I discovered that guy was cheating at Mahjong! Let's go over there and mock him for it! The woman, who of course is Dwella Dent, received a postcard from someone she knew advertising the good life here in the sewer caves. As she exposits to this cat, he snuck up and mailed it with an arrow pointing below the city. Wall-eyed Bill, he wrote, Don't like the world you're in? There's a better one down under. Boy, is she gonna be disappointed to learn that she does not know the difference between Gotham City and Sydney, Australia. The cat was apparently able to track him down here with the postcard. She's going diving with the cat, and fortunately, she's actually trying to keep it safe as she puts it in a plastic bag with air to go through. When I skimmed through this, I was actually worried she was deliberately trying to drown the cat. And as someone who has always had cats, if she had tried to do so, I would have had to stop the review early so I could go track down every copy and set them on fire. Using weights and floats is apparently the only way to navigate through the Nethers, an area of Gotham that was flooded to make a reservoir. Parts of it are underwater, but caves and sewers in it apparently have people still living there, hence the postcard and whatnot. Nethers is a flooded world, bloated water-soaked beds from the homes of people who lived in the town before it was flooded. Creepy everyday tableaus, like some just got up from watching TV to get a snack. Ironically, many of those snacks were powdered to just add water water concoctions. I saw a photo once after a volcano, a couple still hugging in death, covered in ash. The people of Nethers were frozen in whatever everyone was doing when the water came. I'd hate to be the guy who was looking up weird porn when it happened. This place is haunted, haunted by all the families that lived here before the end. One big graveyard. I feel right at home. I've already got a rent-to-buy option going on a little cottage. Best part is, every house is lakefront property. Anything would be better than the boring world above. The only thing that matters up there is what you look like. You're kind of an idiot, aren't you? She spots a crescent moon shape of metal from a graveyard's gate and manages to pull it out before surfacing, finding a few people in another cave who are just fishing or something. Okay, cat, we made it. Now let's find out who runs this place. Lots of Nethers folks out today in the big C-Note cave. If you've never been here before, how would you know that this is a lot? This could be the entire population for all you know. Be nice to find a book to read. Only way I survived my idiot parents was to hide in books. Admittedly, they were 60s knock-knock joke books, but still, they were full of thinking. They all look so happy up here. They all have mates. That guy's mating with a pencil box right now. He looks so happy. Some kids throw rocks at her. Look at ugly. Hit her. She's got no one. Too ugly. Pretty judgy for a bunch of kids who probably aren't dating and who live in a cave that smells like the sewer. Because it is also the sewer. The boys make fun of anyone who's alone. They'll drive us out if I don't find a mate, but I don't want one. So, it's a society built around Tinder? She looks in the water to see how she looks and spots the Joker's face floating in the water, which she briefly mistakes for her own face and finds it beautiful, recounting her childhood. And here's where we really start getting into the edgy backstory, 
And I must offer a content warning for those watching. This involves self-harm, mental health issues, and eating disorders. Viewer discretion is advised. Especially since this comic just uses them as an excuse to try to be DARK! She says she had a bony body when I was young. Anorexic. Okay, was she actually anorexic, or is the comic just saying she was anorexic because of how thin she was? I was gaunt, pale, hollow-eyed, as erotic as bones. Clearly you've never been on the internet. The phrase, jump your bones, has plenty of literal fans out there. Ugly is beautiful, I thought. Ugly is the new beautiful. So naturally, I modeled myself after Baron Harkonnen from David Lynch's Dune. And so she took a razor blade and cut her face. Although the narration refers to it as a box cutter. Yeah, as you can imagine, this comic is not really an examination of what would drive a young girl to do such things to herself or have that attitude. There are hints about what would cause such issues for someone, but it's never explored. The comic cares more about the physical violence and damage than it does about the why and making it compelling or sympathetic. Realizing that the face in the water is not her reflection, she picks it up. It's a mask. Wait, it's not just a mask. It's flesh. How do you know that? This is a face. Oh my god. It's the Joker. How do you know that? He lost his face? Ooh, faced. I need this. I want it. With this face, I can get everything I want. That cosplay contest prize is mine! She admits it's slimy and stinky, but doesn't care because she feels it's a perfect fit against her. Especially the parts where she, presumably, has to dig the wires and staples around it into her own skin, since otherwise, how is that staying on? The Joker has a twisted power. Just right for me. Indeed, as the Dark Knight Returns showed us, he has the power to snap his own neck just by turning it. Man, it's a good thing she had already color-coordinated her outfit to match the Joker's, or this would be weird. She embedded the crescent moon thing on a stick and carries it as she begins exploring the cave, finding a couple around some hot coals. I'm presuming they're actually heated by magma, since Gotham City is on a fault line and all, but I suppose it's possible they just have some coal pits that they light up. A couple roasting a rat. Domestic bliss. She turns the meat on the spit. She cleans his plate. She multitasks. He does nothing. The man sits back fat while the woman is lean. You see? I told you a rat-based diet was healthy! I don't know what Dick's problem is! I'd like to note that the artwork doesn't depict this guy as really any more overweight than she is, so I don't know what she's talking about there. But yeah, apparently she has deduced that the entire society is incredibly misogynistic, with the women abused and forced to do domestic work for the men, who all just sit on rocks all day not watching TV because there are none. I could take over this tribe if I got the women on my side. And who wouldn't want to take over such an amazing society as this? Getting an idea, she attacks the man, who seems to have absolutely no reaction to what's happening. Not even, like, a pained groan or anything. The woman with him recognizes the Joker's face, having been an escapee from Arkham. Who rules the nethers? A man, I presume. Yeah, you... go, girl. I guess. What the hell am I supposed to be feeling about this? Charon, he gives passage to anyone that escapes. On an unrelated note, OH GOD MY FACE IT HURTS IT HURTS SO MUCH MY FACE IT'S SO MUCH PAIN! Seriously, yeah, she knocks him down and they just continue the conversation while she heats up her crescent moon staff in the hot coals. The dude explains that this society is made up of people who escaped from Arkham in the wake of Forever Evil, the event comic that Villain Month was tied into. If Charon likes you, you get shelter and a woman. Well, in your case, you would be given a man. If he's indifferent to you, you get someone non-binary. Taking inspiration from the old Greek comedy Lysistrata, which hopefully I pronounced correctly since last week I screwed up my own joke by not referencing Eratosthenes correctly. She explains the idea of women going on a sex strike to stop the men from going to war and have more say as equals. 
But in practice, she says the women are just going to take over the tribe entirely. She even takes the smoldering hot crescent moon and burns the guy's face so it looks like he's got a clown makeup smile on. And again, despite being burned like this, he's just all... Oh, okay. Were the artist and writer not communicating with each other at all? It feels like there's this massive disconnect between the speech she's giving and the actual acts being performed. She leads some women, who I guess we're watching this? I have no idea about how large this space is. To Charon, expanding the idea of the Lysistrata stuff that they need not fear murderous reprisal if none of the women do stuff. What will the men do if their meals aren't cooked and their homes clean? It's not like the menfolk will clean up their own filth-covered rocks. Again with that disconnect, what homes exactly? And as for that, they won't kill you if none of you do it thing, even as she has pointed out, they're all escapees from Arkham Asylum. Regardless of the realities of mental health issues, in fiction, and in particular Gotham City and Batman stuff, generally that's a place for the criminally insane, the murderous and psychopathic who may have some logic or method to their madness, but will just as likely kill them all because they're not really thinking long term. They finally encounter Charon, who of course is in a boat because subtlety is not this comic's strength. I am Charon. I heard the daughter of the Joker wanted to meet me. Also, I guess you're the daughter of the Joker now, even though you have never referred to yourself as such. He offers her the chance to join their tribe, but she just wants to know about his coat made out of pennies. Which, yeah, that is kind of weird. And heavy, I'd imagine. To set me apart. It's the leader's coat. Somewhere out in Gotham is a supervillain themed around pennies and is just desperately trying to find his costume so he doesn't need to make another one. Also, those are some pretty gold-looking pennies. She attacks him, wanting to take over the tribe and... presumably injures his face given that blood splatter, but later we don't see any wounds on him. He fights back, trying to calm her as he does so. Please, I see that you are in pain. I want to help you. I want you to join our tribe of malnourished women who obey a guy who wears currency as clothing. I'm helping! The guy is physically stronger than her. Maybe he's a metahuman and that's why he can fight so well in the coat. I don't know. And he forces her into the water, able to fight her off enough so that she starts doubting herself. I'm no good. Ugly and no good. A statement that applies to the comic too, frankly. He forces her out of the water and starts pontificating. I was raised here by women. Women who escaped the tortures of above and had to hide out. But it was the men who dug the tunnels, hunted, fixed things. The events of Forever Evil take place over the course of a few days. Assuming you're not an escapee from Arkham Asylum like everybody else apparently is, how friggin' long ago was the Reservoir Project if this area hasn't been cleared out yet and has had a functioning society long enough to clear tunnels and presumably raise this guy since he was a kid. It was a natural flip back to the way things have to be. The rule of men. What the hell did the women do all day if it was just the guys hunting and cleaning tunnels and repairing things? Were they the ones who sat on rocks all the time? He says he'll agree to flip the tribe's gender roles around if the tribe agrees to it. Join us. We would be happy to take you in. Take me in like you have these other women? I'd rather die standing than live on my knees. Why does this comic want us to side with the woman who stapled the Joker's face to her own? Everyone is messed up and I hate them all! What horrible thing happened to you to make you this way? Being willing to die instead of live a horrible life? What new spore of madness is this? So we see more of Dwella's childhood and her birth and the only hintings of what's supposed to be her deal. That apparently her dad was obsessed with things being balanced and was upset that his daughter's face wasn't perfect. And even then I have to guess that that's the case. That like this little sliver of red is meant to be a scar she was born with since I just assumed it was her not being clean from just being born. And somehow that resulted in Dwella torturing animals, making a mobile of knives above her bed, and corsets made of barbed wire! Because her dad was mad at a tiny scar. Presumably. I think. She's so strange, honey. I don't understand. Well, this is what happens when you don't embrace and encourage your child's hobbies. Or maybe you should have just let her play Pokemon instead, I don't know. 
One act of abuse we do see is that she got an ugly looking dog that her dad threw off a bridge. So of course, screw that asshole, and thus Duella started to cut her face. With an actual box cutter this time. She was brought to a hospital for her own safety after that, but she just kept disconnecting her IV and spitting out her medicine. I liked pain. Physical pain is good. It overwhelms the other pain. One shoves the other away. <sighs> just... Just go to hell, comic. The, the levels of poor taste with this. If it was trying to make an actual serious point regarding this stuff, then wow, it is so unbelievably off the mark. This is kind of as bad as Heroes in Crisis, but at least that had aspirations of being better. This comic is just some garbage tie-in to a poorly conceived theme month that only barely ties into an event comic. Oh, and the incompetence continues, because apparently she was having surgery to correct the damage to her face, and they never sedated her, so it only made it worse! What the hell?! And thus we see that part of her face is severely scarred, though admittedly those look like burn marks as opposed to reconstructive surgery, so what the hell did they do in there? Overhearing her father's desire to send her away, she fled out on her own. I should note that most of her narration has been in denial, despite mentioning the animal torture and whatnot, claiming she had happy, loving parents, and that even her departure was just being sent on vacation. As such, Charon doesn't buy the story. You're trying so hard to convince me you were a happy child, but your story hurts my heart. And this story hurts my brain, so I think we're even. Hung a bird, trapped a spider, squirmed under the knife. That's your idea of happy? Become one of us. I'll take you on as a mate myself, if no one else will. Join us, and together we will have matching penny jackets. You'll take me if no one else will? I'm not a charity case. Again, the tone of this is so friggin' weird. Are we supposed to be agreeing with her? Seeing this as some kind of, yeah, fight the evil sexist power, Dwella. Why do you want to hurt me? I forgive you. You know not what you do. Spoken like a concern troll. She says she's gonna remake the world in her image, slamming the burning crescent moon metal into his mouth, where, again, apparently no one around here has pain receptors anymore. And apparently in the ten minutes since this all started, the women have staged a successful revolt by refusing to do stuff, and the women also talked the men into burning the shape into their mouths too. It's like someone saw the, you wanna know how I got these scars, bits in the dark night, and decided, let's just make an entire character based around that. The men say they're tired of being in charge and want the women to give it a shot. Don't you see? She's making you ugly to control you. Injured or unattractive people can control other injured and unattractive people. That's how things work, right? And so our comic ends with Sharon getting exiled as everyone gathers to obey her orders to get ready to show the world what happens when ugly takes over. Also, the women look horrified by all this despite this being what they wanted. Wow, I can't wait to read the Catwoman issues this ties into. Ooh. This comic sucks! It's a crappy, confusing, tone-deaf, badly written book reviving a character but darker and more violent and with very wince-inducing ideas that sound straight out of the 90s book of Look how serious I am, dammit! Take me seriously! I'm an adult! I'm so serious! I'm not for kids! I'm an adult! You know, the new 52 in a nutshell. The best I can say about it is that the artwork isn't terrible, but as I pointed out, there seems like a a massive disconnect between what's happening on the page and what's actually written to have happen. I don't like or care about anyone in it, and I just feel dirty after having read it. Even if her origin wasn't so drenched in the problems I already outlined, the story is just weird in that Dwella is able to make massive leaps in logic with Charon right behind her doing the same. No one acts like a human being should, and the explanations for why that are feel missing, or at least are muddled. I somehow feel emptier reading this than I did after the two issues of ultimate power from last week. At least I could pretend there that there were characters I liked. Next time, let's see if Stan Lee can bring us something a little brighter and more fun as we return to his take on the DC Universe, wherein he creates Aquaman.
She's making you ugly to control you, just like the Joker did on the inside. Hey, Steve, the patients are trying to all be ugly so the Joker can control them again. Man, we really are the worst hospital on Earth, aren't we? Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching.